Okay, let's get going, you guys. So, uh, uh, thanks for being here on time. Uh, sorry, a little bit late, but that's all good. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, so, if you guys have questions, if you guys have logistics questions, some of you guys already asked me about uh, some ad codes for other classes and stuff. Um, or if you guys have questions about our seafood survey, um, uh, afterwards, we'll thank Bob and, and send him on his way, and then I'll, I'll come back and, and get you guys all those logistic things. So we want to um, be respectful to Bob's time. He has to get out to something um, at the end of the class, so we want to uh, stay on track. But I'll definitely hang out as long as you guys need to answer whatever questions. So sound good? Okay. All right, great. So without further ado, our guest today, Bob Poole, is from the Western States Petroleum Association. And um, years ago, when I started teaching this class, um, I was, I was hunting for someone um, that could speak to oil and gas from the oil and gas producers side of things. And uh, hunting around for a while and, and somehow knocked on to the Western States Petroleum Association and uh, the sort of industry group for, for all these um, folks that produce oil and gas. And uh, sent an email in and, and I said, hey, can somebody come talk to us? And he was like, well, I guess I can. What is this about? And I said, well, come on over. And so he very kindly um, for many years came and, and, and represented WISPA uh, for you guys and to your predecessors uh, very well, and I was very appreciative, and we've been very appreciative. Um, he he uh, uh, moved on for a little while, and then he, he's come back, and so this is his first time since he's been back, so I'm very glad to welcome him back here. So you guys can ask him, when we get to the question and answer phase, if you guys want to ask him about his career path, by all means, uh, do so. Um, he, he has been at uh, Chambers of Commerce and things of that nature, um, in terms of getting to the, the, pay, the place where he is in his career. Um, but uh, I'm going to just turn it over to him, and he's going to take us on a journey talking about what's going on historically, but then also right now with a lot of our oil and gas production here in California. So without further ado, uh, Bob Hu. Thank you. So can I get a sense of your major? Is it in environmental science and resource management? Is that basically most of you? Is that all of you? Yeah. <laughs> um, my, uh, my formal education is I have an undergrad degree in political science from University of California, Santa Barbara. Go Gauchos. I'm a Gaucho. Yeah, Gaucho? I'm a Gaucho. And I, I have a Master of Science degree from the University of Maryland in environmental management. Uh, go Sea Turtles. <laughs> so I'm not you, a sea turtle. No. Uh, so if you... Uh, if you you can imagine a gaucho riding a sea turtle. Mm -hmm. That's my combined uh, alma mater. Anyway, it's good to be here. Uh, how many of you ever met a real live oil lobbyist? <laughs> I have. <laughs> well, lobbyists, they're right up there with lawyers, I think, in terms of having a bad <laughs> reputation. But I think the main thing to, to impart with you is, and that's what I do for a living, I lobby, but when you, when I, what I'd like to do is real quick start out by giving you a little better sense of what, what that means, because it really doesn't mean that I go smoke cigars with people in dark rooms and give them money to vote the way I want them to. Is that, did Andy have that perception of what a lobby is? That would be cool, though. That would be cool. I have smoked cigars with legislators, but out in the clear day, and didn't give them any money. So, um, actually, what I do is provide information. And if I don't provide factual information, I don't have any credibility. Does that make sense? If somebody who's in a, a decision-making position, like an elected official or, a, or a, a regulator in the government, and I tell them a story and it's not true, the next time I go back, I'm not gonna have any ability to communicate with them, am I? Because they're gonna, well, hey, I can't trust you. So I, I wanna kind of dispel this notion that I'm some slick purveyor of uh, you know, tr trying to convince people to do any things without, without really holding to the facts. That's just that's not what I do. And in particular in the petroleum industry, because I think we're right up there with the uh, tobacco industry, right? With a lot of people <laughs> in their mind as far as uh, uh, being unpopular. Um, so it's especially important that, that I communicate in a very objective, factual, honest, authentic way. So that's what I want to do today. I want to have a conversation with you about, about energy. It's probably the most important conversation we should be having in a different way. I think you probably all know that uh, there's a lot of conversations about oil, about stopping oil, about, have you ever heard of, have you heard of the most recent uh, movement? It's called Keep It In The Ground. Has anybody ever heard of that movement? 
No, well, that's the latest one. There's a group who thinks we should just keep all the oil in the ground for a variety of reasons. And, you know, they're very heartfelt reasons, and these folks have, have very honest, sincere thoughts about that. And, so, and that's fine. At the same time, there's a, there's a reality around our energy and around petroleum, more importantly. Because petroleum isn't just about energy, and I'll communicate that with you a little bit. Actually, petroleum is about everything. Everything you're sitting on, everything you're wearing, everything you do, your phones, all that would not be possible without petroleum. And it's just a fact. So when we talk about keeping it in the ground and we talk about stopping oil, really that conversation needs to be informed by all of those things because it's such a very important um, part of it. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you some facts and I'm going to give you some emotion and we're going to wrap it all together at the end. And my goal today is to invite you to have a different conversation about energy. And that conversation includes petroleum. So uh, just kind of set you up for that right now. So I'm going to go through some slides. Your professor gave me some homework. <laughs> and uh, a couple of the questions I don't think I'm going to get an A on, but we'll try. I'm going to lean on him. Uh, uh -oh. he, a he asked me to, to uh, specifically address some question areas, which I'll do. And the first one is, is he wants me to give you an overview of the petroleum industry, in particular here on the coast, because you guys are all focused on the coast in particular. But California, basically, a lot of the energy production is either off the shore of the, off the coast or nearby on the onshore. There's quite a bit going on in the Kern County inland, but uh, it is very much a coastal issue. So I'm going to start there. I'm going to tell you a little bit about California's energy picture, how much oil we use. Does anybody know how many barrels of oil California consumes every day? Every day. No wild guess? Well, that's a little high. <laughs> <laughs> that was a guess, though. That was a guess. <laughs> yeah, that's one of those WHEs, right? Anybody else? It's a big number. I'll give you a clue. A billion? Twelve million? No. It's almost two million every day. Think about that a minute. In California, every day we consume almost two million barrels of oil. Do you know how much oil we produce in California every day? Nowhere near that. That's right. About 30%. Does anybody know where we get the rest of it? Overseas. Most of it overseas. I'll show you all that. So that's the start of the conversation. We're using almost 2 million barrels of oil. We're only producing about a third of it. And the rest of it we're importing from overseas. It's kind of hypocritical when we're running around saying we don't want to use oil, isn't it? We'll see. Anyway. So this is WISPA, he mentioned. I work for the Western States Petroleum Association. We're basically an advocacy group on behalf of the petroleum industry in the five western states, California, Washington, Oregon, Arizona, and Nevada, mostly California. We represent folks that produce the oil, transport it, refine it, all that. And we represent over 150,000 people who work in the industry, who are members, who, are, who work for our members. Some of my members, you know all their names if you drive a car. How many of you drive a car? Let me call you, don't you? Most of them. You've ridden in one, anyway. <laughs> um, Chevron, for example, Exxon, all those companies. I work for them. Good? Yeah. By the way, as we go along here, I really invite questions because we're going to have some some information that if you think of something right now, because then I'm going to pile a whole bunch more information on you, you might, you might lose it. So feel free to raise your hand and let me know if you'd like to stop. So does anybody know what this is? A total solar eclipse, right? Last October, there's not this one, but the one passed, there was one that hit the western United States up in Oregon and Washington came down through the middle of the country. I actually went up to eastern Oregon because I wanted to experience what's called the path of totality, which is where you actually get the whole sun gets covered up by the moon. I saw a TED talk. There's a TED talk about this. This guy, he got hooked on it. And he goes to everyone now because he has this spiritual experience. Well, I can to some extent relate to that because I'm planning on going to the one in uh, June 2019 down in uh, Chile, believe it or not. So what this is is obviously the moon 
completely covering up the sun, and there's all kinds of fascinating math as to how that actually happens with the relative size. It's, it's spiritual almost, just thinking about it on that level. But the reason I have this up here is because when I was standing there waiting on this, and then when it happened, the temperature instantly dropped by 10 to 15 degrees. Instantly. You know, you go, oh my God, it's getting cold, just right away. And there was this weird blue-black light all over everything you've never seen before unless you go to one of these. Because it just doesn't occur otherwise. And then you heard the animals, the birds, all these, they go, what the hell's going on? And they, their, their habits change, everything. But the thing that moved me so much was the temperature dropping, 10 to 15 degrees. And that's why I have this slide up here, because it really made me understand how critical energy is in our lives, solar energy in particular in this case. If you ever get a chance, go to the, what's called the path of totality, where it completely covers it up. Have that experience. It's amazing. So here's the questions your professor gave me. He wants me to give you a general overview of oil drilling off Southern California and the mainland, including current production numbers. And I'm going to do all that and then some. He asked me about the Thomas fire and the Refugio spill, how it's impacted our industry and any changes that we made in response to it. And I'll give you kind of an anecdotal answer to that, but I think you may know more about it than I do, given your, <laughs> work, a lot of the work you're doing. And then the shuttering or the closing of uh, Benico, uh, oil company off the coast, operated three platforms, the closest one to shore up off the coast of UCSB, platform Holly and State Waters. Um, which is sitting directly over top of some of the largest natural seeps of oil in the world. And I'll talk about that in a minute, too. Uh, so some of the, the impacts of, of that. And then he wants me to talk about our, our stance <laughs> on decarbonizing California and putting ourselves out of business. Another way to put that. So I'll be glad to do that. Um, one of the things I do for WISPA is I work up in Sacramento a lot. I deal with the legislators, I deal with the regulators. I try to reach agreement. Mostly what I'm doing, I'm a mediator, I guess. I try to reach agreement between the oil companies and the regulators and the legislators on policy. And I'll show you some policies I've been working on. So let's start with number one here. I'm gonna give you start with this overview. Now here's some quick facts, and by the way, you can, I don't know if you can see it, but the facts I have to deal with are facts that are third-party facts that are verifiable. A lot of the folks who I have to engage with don't necessarily have to adhere to that, but what I'm telling you is I'm giving you facts. This is from the U.S. Energy Information Administration, a great resource for you, the EIA. They do all things energy. You can find out all kinds of stuff on there. I highly recommend you check that out, the EIA. And by the same token, in California, there's one called the California Energy uh, Commission, and their charge primarily is to deliver to the governor what's called an integrated energy policy report every two years. But they are the ones that are really dealing with all the energy issues in California. And so that's another website, the CEC, California Energy Commission. So just to give you, a, now these are, uh, this is United States. So 94% of our fuels comes from oil. 32% of our energy demand is met by oil. By 2040, the total energy demand is projected to increase by 12%, primarily population. And that, that probably includes in, in, uh, energy efficiency increases, so that's on top yeah, of all that. A, yeah. Yep. And in 2040, 32% of our energy will, I should put the word, still be met by oil. This is the federal government telling us this. This is part of my thesis here for you to understand that for the foreseeable future, Petroleum needs to be a part of this energy conversation. Not because we want it to be, because it just is. Has to be, the nature of it. And in 2040, fossil fuels will still be needed to meet 80% of our energy demand. It's a big number. It's really an issue of scale. It's so huge. When you hear about solar, wind, increasing by 100%, that's great and things are progressing. That's 100% of a very small percentage, and so there's an incremental uh, component to that. And so I just want you to understand that the scale, we are dealing with an enormous challenge in order to displace petroleum in our lives. And then there's everything else we use petroleum for. You know, I usually go through an exercise 
where I try to ask you, and maybe we can do it real quick, it's always fun. Can anybody tell me something that isn't either directly made from oil or uses oil to be made? Can you come up with anything? Made by humans? Yeah, in our society, mm -hmm. everything. Food? Food? Mm -hmm. Actually, food is grown, right? A lot of it either animals or plants, and uh, fertilizers, for example, to grow the food, that's petroleum-based. Um, all of the equipment that's used to harvest it. See how you're starting to, somebody else? Solar power. What's that? Solar power. Solar power, okay. So solar power is generated by what? Solar panels? Well, the sun, but what's that? Photovoltaic cells. Mm -hmm. How do you think they're made? Yeah, they're made. <laughs> what can I tell you? A Prius. I owned a Prius up until recently. You owned one forever, right? And uh, I, I, you know, I, interesting article about the Prius when you start looking at that, or the Tesla. Great cars. So much of them are dependent upon petroleum to be made, which is fine. I'm not poo-pooing those things, but to understand the nature and the scale of the challenge we face, even with these things. I, I have one. I have one. Uh, we have some uh, hand-carved uh, salad tongs out of wood. <laughs> so that's, there you go. Well, where'd the, where'd, how'd you get the wood? Uh, Thomas Fire. Okay. <laughs> what, was it a log or did you yeah, carry it? Yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a, it was a bran branches branch. And how, how'd you get it to where you carved it? I walked it all the way from <laughs> Ojai. <laughs> <laughs> we'll keep going, I guess. <laughs> try those, sir. So uh, here's some, here are the petroleum products that are made out of a barrel of oil, just to give you the breakdown. A barrel of oil is 42 gallons, obviously, and you can see about a little less than half of it is, on average, is made gasoline. Now we can get into the chemical molecules and all that, and they're heavier and lighter molecules that make these different things, but basically there's a kind of a, a breakdown of, on the average, this is what we use a barrel of oil for. I have a question. Yes, sir. Is the composition of crude oil the same everywhere, or is it vary depending on the deposit? Uh, It'll vary a bit. This is, a, this is like a generic uh, one. So, oh, yeah. so, so uh, there's um, heavy and light breakdowns. So lighter are going to have a higher proportion of the things like the jet fuel and the things that are um, uh, these different uh, polymers of different length. Uh, our area tends to be really thick with asphaltines, so we tend to have a lot of the more thicker, the heavier side of stuff. But all petroleum will have some some uh, uh, fractionation of this. This is just sort of like an average picture of the average well. The ma main breakdowns would be uh, that people deal with in terms of selling stuff and, and producing stuff would be heavy versus light, so the proportion of the, the lighter molecule stuff versus the heavier molecule stuff, and then a sweet and sour. And that refers to the amount of sulfur, because there's other stuff in the ground with this, not just the oil. There's yeah. some water, and then uh, hydrogen and, and sulfurous compounds are the other part. And so the, the sweet versus sour is how much sulfur is in there, because it, it is more dangerous, but also it's more complicated chemically to refine it if it's got a lot of the, the sulfur in it, the so-called sour stuff. So the, that's the main thing, the petroleum, the water, and the, the, the sulfur stuff. Right. Yes, and, and um, for example, refineries, he mentioned the word fraction, fractionation. Refineries of varying degrees are designed depending on what the primary, what they call the crude slate coming in, what he was speaking about, the different heavies and light. And they have machines like what are called crackers, that they can crack these longer strings of molecules and get at the lighter ones. Because the lighter ones generally sell for more money than the heavier ones. Uh, but the heavier ones are asphalt, for example, the real thick stuff. Uh, there's a refinery up in uh, Napomo, just north of Santa Maria, and what they're, they're connected to a refinery up in the Bay Area. They're owned by Phillips 66, and what they do is they take this heavier crude that's produced in a lot of places here, and they take it and make asphalt out of some of it. They take the sulfur out, the, the hydrogen sulfide, the sulfur out, and make elemental sulfur, which is used for fertilizer and they shoot the lighter stuff up to the Rodeo refinery up in the Bay Area where they make these higher value, lighter molecule products out of it. Give me an example. So here's your home. 
be a nice home, huh? Three stories. <laughs> <laughs> so everything, everything, this just reinforces what I was talking about earlier, petroleum in your life. Here's a partial list. Um, and we can talk about to what extent mm -hmm. these things are, but you know, some of the some of the things that fascinate me, aspirin, two chemicals that make up aspirin come from petroleum hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. More cosmetics, plastics, plastics. Is that about everything when you say plastic? You know, a lot of your clothes are actually plastic. The synthetic fabrics, nylon, rayon, those are all plastic. Now, you get something a little fun. This is the video. Uh, one of the companies, California Resources Corporation, actually they did some previous videos. One was called Hydrocarbon Man, and one was called Hydrocarbon Woman. This is uh, Imagine a Day in the Life uh, Without Petroleum. state economy. We got about a tenth of the population of the United States here. Seventh largest world economy. I just read somewhere we were fifth, but I'll have to check that. I don't know if everybody knows. I, th I think, yeah, I think we're fifth. I think, I think. We're fifth yeah. We're the, we were the third largest producer of oil and natural gas. Now we're sixth and we're almost dropping to seventh. We import, here's what I was talking about earlier. We import over 69%, over a million barrels a day of our oil, mostly from foreign countries. We do get a little bit, 10, 11% comes from Alaska, but it comes in over ships, what are called Alaska class tankers, they come down the coast. There are no, and this is the key point, there are no pipelines bringing crude oil into the state of California. All the oil that comes in has to come in via tanker over the ocean. So 90% of our natural gas we have to import and 25% of our electricity. So. We're not self-sufficient by any means. Here's some more facts. 92% of California's transportation fuels are petroleum-based. Remember, nationwide it was 94%. We're making a little progress there. We use 48 million gallons of gasoline every day. Two million gallons, I like that, an hour, two and a half. And we're the third largest consuming entity on Earth of fuel behind the United States and China. California's third. So, you know, California is known to be leaders. We have the <laughs> biggest challenge of all of the states leading ourselves into a, a, a diverse energy mix, et cetera, a different energy portfolio. So California, as I mentioned before, we, get, we produce about 31% from the California Energy Commission. Alaska 12 and foreign countries 57%. So I mentioned there's no pipelines coming into California. California is what we call an energy island. Everything has to come in over the ocean. And interestingly enough, you see the arrows going out to Reno and to Las Vegas and also the ones going up to Washington and Oregon. Well, Oregon particularly does not have a refinery. So we produce just about all of the gasoline in California that we would need, but we send 10, about 10% 10 of it up to Oregon. 
and then we have to import some finished gasoline in order to, to replace that. Now, it takes about 40 days for a ship to get here from the Middle East. Now, if you assume an average tanker, just for a simplistic way to put, it, put your mind around this, if you imagine a tank, super tanker, holds about a million barrels of oil, and we're importing, or we use about a million barrels a day, and it takes 40 days for it to get here, <coughs> think about 40 tankers between here and Saudi Arabia lined up one day apart. Kind of like a conveyor belt. I mean, that's a simplistic and not completely accurate because we don't get all our oil from Saudi Arabia, but if you think about it, in a lot of ways, it, it really adds a nice vista point. Now, these are pipelines all over the United States. The yellow one is that proposed keystone that's so uh, in the news all the time, coming up to bring some of the uh, Canadian crude down. All the green ones there, as you can see, those are crude oil pipelines that exist. And you can see there aren't, there aren't any coming into California. And then we've got natural gas pipelines, all those other pipelines down below, underneath. How many of you have heard recently, last year, I guess, uh, down in what's called Aliso Canyon Porter Ranch down in Southern California, where some of the gas wells that were storing gas were leaking and leaked all the natural gas, SoCal gas? I think that's the second largest supplying uh, storage facility for natural gas in the Western United States. And so natural gas, it's gas, right? So, I mean, you, unless you liquefy it down to a point where you can kind of transport it like oil, it, you really have to find some place to put it in its gaseous state. And so they, they've used underground wells to actually inject this stuff down into the ground and keep it there until they need it. A lot of it's LA's gas supply. And some of these wells, uh, I think, were not properly maintained, and so um, they, they leaked and ruptured and released all this natural gas. It's a major issue. Here's another example of the natural gas pipelines. These are the ones coming into California, and these are to give you a sense of the, the gas basins where, where, and by the way, natural gas is petroleum, right? It's the gaseous form of the hydrocarbon. We'll get to that in a minute. So these are the basins where uh, gas, uh, natural gas is coming in a pipeline. And that natural gas, by the way, just so you know, it, it just, they just put something in it to make it smell, so you can smell it if it's on and it's not lit. But basically, it just goes right into your stove and you use it to burn, to cook with, and all the other things you use it for. So here's where California gets its crude oil that it imports every day. Saudi Arabia's up there, about 30% of our oil every day comes from Saudi Arabia. We know they're in the news lately. <laughs> Ecuador, Iraq, Kuwait. Now, from the United States, the United States produces oil and even exports some. California does not. This is one of the this is one of the, the pieces of misinformation I hear out there all the time. California even if we started producing more oil in California, what's to say we wouldn't export it? Because the United States exports oil. Well, I told you before, we're only producing about 30%. We're importing over almost 70%. So does it make sense that we would produce oil and export it if we still need 70% of it here? It just doesn't make sense economically. It's not being done. So California does not export oil. In the United States, does anybody know what the number one importer of oil into the United States is? No, but good guess. Think about it this way. There are other countries nearby that produce oil. And remember, it's a question of economics, right? If something's closer, Canada is one of them. Canada's number two, Mexico. Mexico is the number one supplier of oil to the United States, not California. You can see California, though, we get about 4% from Mexico. And we get, what, about 4% from Canada, coincidentally. But the largest importing countries into the United States, aside from Canada, or aside from California, is Mexico and Canada. So what's the future look like? Well, the projections are we're not going to produce more oil in California even though we have lots of reserves here. And the Alaska stuff is gonna to continue to trend down. 
although they just out opened uh, that little park postage stamp of Anwar, uh, so there may be there might be an uptick in that. And then foreign sources look like they're going to go up. So that's not a not, not a very good trend from a lot of a lot of areas. Does anybody know what the human rights issues are in the Middle East? Do we have any idea? What about Saudi Arabia? I think they just started letting women drive, didn't they? So we're, we're helping fund these countries that don't share the same values that we do. So that's part of my political pitch here. But keep about it, and keep thinking about it in your mind. What we're doing may conflict with something else you feel strongly about. And it, it's a very complex issue. Zach, do you have a question? Oh, sorry. Yes, sir. Is this current? Because that goes to 2017. So. Yeah, it's as far, there's a lag. See, we're still in 2018. And so generally we don't get a lot of data till beginning of 2019 for 2018. Did you have a, any other thoughts or just wanted to question it? Well, I was just wondering because this is the future trends and the funny stuff. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's, it's, that's apparently what the state is, of, of most of it being foreign. Which is recession or adapting. Right. But so currently, California is importing about 67% of the oil we use every day. Right now. Still are. Actually, we're importing more because, and I'll get to it in a little bit, but the Plains Pipeline that runs, uh, it's called the Plains All-American Pipeline that would take crude to the refineries from uh, some of the offshore platforms, uh, actually from the Las Flores Canyon processing facility north of Santa Barbara. When the Plains Pipeline had a rupture in 2015, it shut down the pipeline, so therefore it shut down production offshore, in particular of ExxonMobil's three platforms and that accounted for over 30,000 barrels of oil a day. So that's since 20, so that's fig, that number's figured into that because of 2017 it captured it. But that, uh, that's an example. And then Benico, when they uh, mothballed the platform Holly, that, that increased that need to import because we can't get it anywhere else. Sir? All right, so you're saying like, we're getting a lot of oil from overseas? Yes. We're depleting, basically we're depleting their oil reserves while maintaining ours. <laughs> so like if if Saudi let's say the straits were moose all of a sudden are shut down, all the oil coming from the United Arab Emirates and from Iraq, that's all cut off. The United States has a huge oil reserve that we can now tap. That we're is untapped potential. And like that gives us security in the future, does it not? Well that's an interesting argument and it there's validity to it. At the same time, let me pose an alternative question to you, and I'll get to this later. We're producing the oil here in, the United, in California under the most stringent environmental regulations on the planet. Are you guys familiar with CEQA? Have you had a test on it yet? Uh, CEQA is the most stringent guidelines, that, and, and the oil is produced that way. The oil overseas is not produced that way. So when you're thinking about global climate change, you need to think about that in the context of yeah, maybe we're hedging our bet by keeping our resources, but at the same time, the less oil we produce here, the more we're actually making climate change worse. So it's kind of ironic. California's a leader in climate change and, and you know, trying to reduce the, the carbon intensity of our fuels, and we have things like the low carbon fuel standard and all these things. At the same time, 70% of our oil, and the governor, uh, Brown, spoke to that, and I'll show you his quote in a minute. So I guess I would just offer you, you're exactly right, you are, we are doing that. And there's lots of oil here, and I always happen to say, well, it'll be there when we need it. Um, but, you know, there's, there's all these advantages, disadvantages, unintended consequences to any decision. For example, uh, wind, wind power kills birds. You know, those kinds of issues. When you start looking at things, you really gotta look at both sides of the issue, and I think when you're talking about keeping our oil, China, by the way, does that. China can produce, I think it produces about 30% of the oil that it uses. It, it could produce more, but it goes out and buys it on the market. I think it's produce, it's saving its resources very strategically in that command control economy. You have a question? Aren't all those oil engine countries still on the Paris climate change accord still? So they would be working for more environment. Well, when you get into the Paris climate change accord, you'll see there are varying degrees of compliance schedules, and a lot of those countries are not really complying right now. Well, at least they're on it, right? Well, okay. So I'm talking they, about they, now. But they have a, they, they're supposed to have a plan to work towards less emissions. Yeah, and that's a, and that's a good thing. 
But what I'm saying to you is now, we are importing oil that we could be producing here in the most stringent way. Instead, we're, we're dumping our, our emissions offshore into these countries, these third world countries. The governor has a quote about it, I'll get to that in a minute. Anybody else? The governor for another, what? Two weeks, days, yeah, two yeah. Weeks? Well, yeah, four weeks, I guess. Means. Then we're gonna have Gavin Newsom, Lieutenant Governor. So uh, I'm gonna keep going here. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna get more closer to the coast. How are we doing on time, all right? You're, you're good, you're good. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about coastal production here, and then we'll give you a little snippet about rigs to reef and about natural seas, okay? So as your professor was talking about earlier, um, Petroleum is produced by the, the decay from carbon matter, both plants and animals, that was laid down in sediments, in this case in California, millions of years ago when there were various seas here. For the most part, the oil that's in California is trapped in marine sediment from oceans that receded, came in, and the sediment kept falling and getting down further and further. So these plants and animals, as their carbon-based forms decayed, into this black muck. They also, uh, the anaerobic bacteria component of that is what produces, I believe, the H2S, the hydrogen sulfide. And uh, the natural gas is also the gaseous form of that, that carbon. And there's a lot of water. Have you ever, has anybody ever seen the experiment where you take a glass of sand and you pour water in it and kind of water like disappears? It holds a lot of water because of the porosity of the, of the sand. And you probably walked on the beach where the tide is just, or the wave has just crashed in, and you walk on that wet sand, and it, water comes out kind of around your foot. Well, there's a lot of water that gets trapped in that marine sediment, those sand and silt deposits, uh, over the years with that carbon matter, with those plants and animals. And that's what you have here in California is, and I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but you have a lot of water in addition to uh, the sulfur, the, the gas, and the, the uh, oil. And there are four things, as I mentioned. Now, a lot of that water, we want to put it back where we got it because we don't need it. And it's brackish ancient seawater for the most part. To some extent, depending on the formation, it can be cleaned up to, to, to for certain uses. And I'll get to that in a minute. But for the most part, the volume of it is such that we, have, on average, oil companies could, would actually be better aptly named water companies because we produce about 15 barrels of water for every barrel of oil on average. And it's that ancient brackish salty seawater. We have to put it somewhere. So there's all kinds of regulations. We're re-injecting it down. There's also some beneficial reuses, some recycling capabilities, et cetera. But that water normally is not part of a water table. <coughs> it's way down deep, much deeper than the, the, the traditional rain water uh, and drinking water. And it wouldn't be, we wouldn't have access to it if it wasn't that the oil companies were getting it, pumping it up to get the oil out of it. So as I was mentioning before, here's a little snippet about the water. So we did this, this is a survey of our members. So this is real data from the real world. An average 15 barrels with every barrel of water, of oil. And the, the enormity of this, and I'll show you another slide relative to the coastal counties on this to give you, show you a little variation depending on the marine sediment and how much water was trapped in it. 542.5 million barrels in 2015 uh, was, was produced, was used or disposed of just in the first quarter of 2015. So multiply that out, it's about 2 billion barrels a year, that year. So enhanced oil recovery, does anybody know what that is? Ever heard of that? Like fracking? That's a form of, that's, that's actually called well stimulation, but I guess you could argue that it is a part of how to enhance the process to produce oil so we, we can get there, but it is technically a, 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 a different animal. Um, enhanced oil recovery is when we inject water or steam or something down in there to get more of the oil out, maybe to push it over to the well, uh, or in the case of uh, the steam injection, a whole other thing where you're actually uh, making it more, vi more viscous, less viscous, uh, so that it moves more, uh, all kinds of matter. But enhanced oil recovery, we can use the water to do that, to push the oil or to heat it, to make steam with it, and then use it to get more oil out. 
So you can see water provided to agriculture. Some of this water can be cleaned up to the point where it can be used for agriculture. Uh, for example, tertiary treated is where they um, take all the, the microbes and bacteria out so it can be used for that. And two of the, two, two of the, uh, the big oil company uh, producers in, in the San Joaquin Valley over in Kern, Chevron and uh, California Resources Corporation, both provide uh, quite a bit of oil, or excuse me, produced water every day to the local water districts so that they can then use it to, to help the farmers grow crops. And then aquifer recharge, put it back down into the ground. I'll get to something in a minute. It's called the uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. And purchasing water for use is 6.1 million barrels. And I want to put that in context here in a minute. So here's a graph that kind of reflects what I just said. I think I'm standing in your way all the time, aren't I? Um, so this is basically here. Water use for operations, 2%. The big one produced water treated and used for enhanced oil recovery. Basically, we're putting that water back down where we got it uh, or in close areas to get more oil out of the ground. So, the, and the reason that I put this out here is because there's a, a lot of conversation out there about oil companies that are using all kinds of water, taking water away from ag and for use for us and everything. And the reality is, this. And I'll show you in a point of comparison. Does anybody here play golf? No golfers. No, yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's a golfer. I was going to say, it, it, it's really not something you play to you. <laughs> Don't have, yeah, it takes money and time. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason I ask is, now HF, that's hydraulic fracturing. That's part of that, that conversation you're probably hearing out there about all this water is being used for hydraulic fracturing. Well, the average range of a hydraulic fracturing job is 80,000 to 300,000 gallons. It averages less than 200,000. And an average golf course uses 312,000 gallons every day. Now, if you're in the desert, it's over 500,000. So it may sound, 200,000 gallons may sound like a big number, but relative to other things, it, and it's important to have context. It's also important to say that the California, um, the way this enhanced oil recovery and fracking, this stuff happens in California is, is generally different than some of these other formations elsewhere in the US. And sometimes when you guys read news articles or see papers, um, the numbers will be different from this, but that's because they're talking about the situation, say, in Pennsylvania or, or something else. So just to be clear, uh, um, just like California's an energy island, also the formations are a bit different than some of the more generic, some of the other formations elsewhere in the U.S. Thank you. Um, when it, and just elaborate a little bit more on that. You've probably heard of horizontal drilling, a big thing that's kind of revolutionized our ability. It's really uh, is used where you have uh, more continuous geologic formations. California has got has had upheaval for a long time, and you just, just look on the hills and you'll see that inverted stratigraphy, et cetera. And so in California, we really don't do horizontal wells where you have what are called multi-frack multi, uh, jobs where you can produce oil from one well for way out for a mile or two. Now that is the case in Pennsylvania, North Dakota, et cetera, where they, these are bigger wells, they've got much more dynamic going on, and so they're using much more water. But in California, most of the wells are just straight vertical wells, and so they're not, they're, they're, it, it's a little different animal. So it's on the lower, it's on the low side of these things when you think about California. So, and you make a good point. Be aware when you're hearing this stuff, it's like night and day between California and the rest of the country in a lot of ways. So all the hydraulic fracturing in California in one year uses half of one day's water usage of California golf courses. Sir? So this is just a quick question. Um, I know that oil companies don't use the sewage water, but like toilets and top systems take sewage water, like which is like super dirty water, and convert that into drinking water. Is there any way or is there any potential for oil companies to start using reverse osmosis systems to clean that wastewater into a perfectly fine drinking water? They're already doing it to a degree. The trouble is to get a lot of this water to the point you're saying yeah. it's way cost inhibitory. Oh, yeah. It's just it's just not cost. 
So it, the technology's there, it's just mm -hmm. way yeah, too costly. Yeah. Um, so here's a little snapshot of where the oil's produced in California onshore. We'll get to the offshore in a minute. But you can see the color code there, Bakersfield, Kern County, is where most of it is produced. You know, interesting, Kern County has an interesting uh, reputation. It is the largest producer of oil in the state. It is the largest producer of wind power in the state. And it is the largest producer of solar power in the state. All three at one county. So you've probably all been out to Tehachapi, right? You've seen the windmills and you've seen a lot of the solar arrays out in there. So Kern is, is uh, fascinating. Is It's the energy county, for sure. Here's a little thing I put together to kind of give you a sense of things. So um, I have Ventura County bolded there. And you can see that uh, there's 3,200 wells in Ventura. These are all onshore wells. Uh, with those 32 wells, they produce about 4% of the total oil produced onshore. And this was 2016 data. And you can see that in order to produce 7 million barrels of oil, they produce 55 million barrels of water. Now that's probably what, and what we in the industry call cut. That's not 15 to one. So you're not getting as much water out of those. You can see LA, they're producing, they've got a little better ratio there where they, where they got 21 versus 889. So that's, that's up there. But if you'll, the bottom line here is, is if you look at that in California, to produce 186 million barrels of oil from these counties onshore. You're producing over 3 billion barrels of water. Okay, so here's another little version of that, only this little breakdown here. Um, so in the valley, what we call the valley, the San Joaquin Valley, primarily Kern, County. There is oil produced in Fresno County, for example, in uh, Kalingua is where the most of that is. So in the valley, it's made up of 16 counties. They produce about 75% of the oil onshore that we use. And on the coast, uh, the rest. And the coast is produced onshore and offshore, Ventura, Santa Barbara. The only place it's produced offshore is LA, Ventura, Santa Barbara counties. I'll show you those in a minute. So, you've probably heard of crude by rail, bringing crude oil in. You know, there's no pipelines coming into California, so it either comes in by tanker, but there's oil being produced east of here, and so they want to try to get it to a market, so there is some oil coming in by rail car, but you can see it really ain't much. New Mexico, Wyoming, and Canada, that was uh, barrels per day at the end there. So about 8,600 barrels, and how many barrels are we using every day? 1.8 to 2 million barrels, so it's negligible. So here's another little map that shows you where most of the oil is. The stuff way up on the top right-hand part of the screen, uh, that's more in the San Joaquin Valley, so what I'd like you to do is focus on the coast here. And you can see in northern Santa Barbara County, there's a whole bunch of oil fields up there. And then you'll notice down in Ventura, have a pointer, but down there you can see those. And I, one thing is, how many of you, when you've been driving up the coast, for those of you that drive, and from Ventura, at one point, you see the platforms and they all line up in a straight line. You ever notice that? Well, what that is, is this is the Ventura oil field here on shore. It actually projects out into the ocean. And so what the oil companies did was they put the platforms right as it goes. And so those circles up there that don't have any, any green in them, those are areas that uh, they've discovered oil in, but they're, um, for one reason or another, they're not being produced, haven't been produced. The, the leases were turned away. But you can see that there's lots of oil off the coast of Santa Barbara County, both up in the northern part and in the southern part. The northernmost platform is called Platform Irene, and it's right up in right up in here producing off of this. And then when you drive up the highway from coming out of Goleta 
And you see those big platforms off the coast up there? Those three platforms are operated by ExxonMobil. ExxonMobil is the only remaining major oil company producing oil offshore. All the other platforms are owned by companies, smaller companies that they sold them, that the different oil companies sold them to. Okay, a little bit about economics, just to give you a sense of our industry. This is from the Los Angeles Economic Development Corporation. So employment by education, we have an interesting story to tell in our industry because um, we have very high salaries. Uh, entry level salary averages are sixty dollars to $80,000 a year, and those are for people who don't even have a high school diploma. Now it's hard work in the fields, but it gives people an opportunity to progress without the education that you guys are getting. So you can see with BA or higher, our workforce is about 23%. We desperately need engineers. We desperately need people like you, and we pay well, so that's my pitch. <laughs> Here's the diversity of our workforce. About 30% is Hispanic, 13% Asian. I spelled other wrong there, didn't I? Well, maybe it's, maybe it's another group that we don't know about. <laughs> yeah, from some island. <laughs> So here's some of the economics of our industry. We employ almost 400,000 people. We contribute, I don't know what the state budget is right now. It's around 150 billion or 160 billion. I don't, I'm not sure what the number is, but uh, we're part, pretty much contribute uh, one year to the state budget. Uh, you can see the taxes. And in California, you can see that uh, the wages, there's the average wage for the oil and gas industry is $84,000 versus uh, the other industries. And that's from the LA Economic Development Corporation data. Now, let's get a little closer here. I always like to say that you drill down. <laughs> that's funny, that's good. Uh, Monterey, San Luis, Santa Barbara, Ventura County is the coastal production region other than LA. A lot of oil is produced in LA, as you saw from that previous step slide I had. Um, you can see the jobs there. Just here's, here's Ventura County. 6,000 jobs, 1.6 billion economic contribution. Labor income, 657 million. So it's a, it's a number. <laughs> so I always put this up. Now, granted, I don't know when the hell the price of gas was $1.76. <laughs> I guess it was February 2016. But it, it, these are kind of percentages and they, they, they're pretty good. It, actually, I need to get a new pump because we just got a new gas tax that uh, actually survived an attempt to recall it in November, as you may well know. And uh, so that'll figure into it. But just so you know, pretty much uh, a quarter of the price of that gas that you're putting in your car is taxed. From different sources. Different so sources. there's federal, state, there's state, local. local. Yeah. yeah. Local is the sales tax, whatever your sales tax is. You got federal and state. Uh oh, another question from the professor. <laughs> there we go. So the Thomas Fire and Refugio spill, most of you are all familiar with. The Refugio spill happened in May 2015. It was a pipeline rupture north of Santa Barbara. And was it? It's 120,000 gallons, I think, spilled. Is that about right? And so you divide that by 42 to get to the number of barrels. Um, but um, that currently, that progress project, which I'll get to in a minute, uh, is uh, that pipeline is shut down, and so that has shut down all that offshore production while they're going through a process to either repair or replace the pipeline. And I'll talk to you about that in a minute. So three and a half years, right, since that happened. Yeah. And we're they're expecting another thank you. We're expecting them two to three years easily before. Um, the way I understand it is the big pipeline, the 30 inch pipeline that exists now, they can replace that and get back on without really going through a lot of the permitting process because they already have the, the, uh, the ability. But what Plains is proposing is to put a new smaller pipeline in and that has to go through a complete permitting process. So depending on what the county and the state and the feds decide to do, the timelines may vary on that. But there are two proposals, one to replace with a smaller line, one to repair the existing line. And they repair the existing line, they already basically have permission. Um, now, I tell you that because my understanding, and, and please jump in here, 
the, the, the oil companies I represent, and, some, and they were ERA and CRC, and they were right down there in the Thomas Fire. Uh, they basically- And Venico, right, was, was Venico. Venico, was Venico. Uh, in, their, in their normal course of operations, they're very fire conscious. They're very much brush control, very much tuned into fire suppression, the potential for a fire, et cetera. So to some extent, they're prepared. Now, I understand that basically they shut their fields in right away, and to a certain extent, there wasn't a lot of damage. Now, I know there's a story about the, the seeps and them getting lit on fire and all that, but I, my answer to your question, hopefully I'll get at least a B, <laughs> is, is that I think by and large, not a whole lot of an impact. Now, there was some uh, political uh, rhetoric spinning around at the time, but by and large, I'm not aware of anything major. Do you have anything to share on that? No, I don't. So, so that's why I was, I was curious if there was something I didn't know about. So, so uh, Bob's right. So, the, um, so very similar to like a hurricane, right, coming in when there's a, when there's a uh, unknown factor coming into the production, the, the default condition is to turn everything off, right? So there isn't a, so if a, if a fire did, I don't know, burn up a seal on a pipeline or something, it wouldn't, wouldn't just flow out continuously, right? So things are shut in. That's what you call it when you put a, when you sort of turn the valve and, and turn off the, uh, the production. Um, so, so by and large, uh, the, the oil company properties were not affected, or maybe the way to say it is minimally affected, right? I mean, there's, there's obviously power lines and things like that that would come down, and you need power to power these uh, pump jacks and things of that nature. But it was relatively minimal, right? Like on the order of weeks, weeks ish, kind of, kind of thing. Um, I was just curious, given given the coming on sort of the heels, the refugio spill that was sort of messing with pipeline moving moving around. I didn't know if that that additional constraint because of transportation stuff, if that if that pushed anybody over the edge, any of the smaller producers or... What well, did it forced basically Benico into bankruptcy? Oh, of the refugio, totally. But I, I just meant I w with the Thomas fire, I didn't know if that, that if anybody survived refugio, but then that, that couple months of, of uh, impact from the Thomas fire, if that in turn caused any additional impacts. Not really? Not that I was made aware of or that uh, our members communicated, yeah. So, so to be clear, so with the refugio, idea, right, the idea there was we have the, sh the, the um, wells offshore primarily is what, what the area we're talking about is. And so, um, so what Bob said was that California has the most stringent environmental rules in terms of petroleum production and stuff. That's true, but the more important point is probably that um, Ventura, but especially Santa Barbara County is in a whole other class. So Santa Barbara County has an incredible amount of influence on um, oil and gas production because of the 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. The, we're almost to the 50th anniversary of that. And so um, uh, because of that history, they have a lot of special agreements. So when the refugio spill is happening, when we have the incident command structure, uh, it depends on if it's on land or in the water, but, but we have these extending, um, um, existing protocols for how we respond to an oil spill, right? And who's in charge and what entity's in charge, but also, just like with our wildfires, who's in the room? Who's in the, who's, what are the groups that are there to help manage the, the disaster? And the only place that a county is in the, is in the mix is Santa Barbara County. So it's written into law that if an oil spill happens in Santa Barbara, they use the emergency operations center of the county and they're at the table. So if that, if that spill, well, it impacted obviously Ventura County as well. Ventura County is not at the table, right? And so one of the things you guys have seen with the, just the last few weeks with the Woolsey fire, right? Communication is a key part of how we deal with these disasters. And part of it is just the communication, but part of it is also informing the public what's going on, where the right place to evacuate is, uh, how long you can, when's it, how long is it gonna take for you to get back to your house, all those kind of things, right? And it's very clear that um, public opinion about how the refugio spill, how the Deepwater Horizon, how whatever you want to pick, this disaster, the, the public's impression, initial impression, is how much they feel that they've been informed. And so when you don't have the entity that is, is mostly responsible for evacuating you, et cetera, in the mix, it takes longer to get the information. People get more frustrated, et cetera. 
So in the refugio spill, um, uh, unusually the county was involved, but, but if we talk about the Deepwater Horizon or, or other things, it's a lot of filter, 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 filter through that, and it tends to translate into slower information transfer, less trust, people getting more and more angry, and they get, um, and they get irate. Uh, so, yeah, I guess I'll say that. Yeah, I'll just add on to that. There is one other example. Um, a few years ago, I, one of the things I did was I worked for the off, I worked for WISPA on the, with the Office of Spill Prevention and Response, referred to as OSPR. It's a division of Fish and Wildlife, and they're the ones in charge of interacting in this in incident command structure with the Coast Guard at the Fed level and, and the local entity. And there was a, a container ship called the Costco Busan that ran into a pier up in the San Francisco Bay and it leaked oil. And, and uh, subsequent to that, they uh, made special provisions. So there's 13 communities, I believe, around that Bay Area, and they have a rotating representative on the incident can command structure for that exact reason, the same, same analogy. But, but Santa Barbara County, you're right. Santa Barbara County has its own energy division, and other counties come to it to model it. I mean, it's because uh, since the 50s, with the offshore oil San, and onshore oil, Santa Barbara County has got lots of oil all over on the onshore, offshore, etc. So they, by baptism, had to get through that process, and so they they've evolved to where they're the they're the sharpest game going. And I, I work very closely with them, and um, they uh, they definitely have the infrastructure in place to do exactly what you're saying, and they demanded it. Any questions around around this? So just so I don't need to summarize. So so refugio spill, lots of impacts. Um, most conspicuously, I would say that the I think I, I got distracted and didn't finish what I was saying. So um, we we move our oil by pipeline, right? So what, what Bob was showing those pipelines. So the stuff that we do in the channel goes by pipeline to refinery. So that was that was uh, put to popular vote um, in the 80s and and all this and that, and people decided. Um, that pipelines were safer than tankers and safer than rail and trucking, right? So yeah. that's why we have the pipelines. And so, uh, but in this case, and then just after that in Hall Canyon, uh, another uh, pipeline in, in the city of Ventura ruptured, right? And, and they, they both were failures of the pipeline. So the point is there's no perfectly safe way to move this oil around no matter what. But when we have these disasters, and, and so clearly something was wrong with the system, right? We all agree. Nobody wants oil leaking. The oil companies, people advocating for the beach, nobody wants to see that. So the fact that this failed is a huge problem, I would say, right? But uh, that doesn't necessarily negate the fact that pipelines are the safest way to move uh, the oil and gas around, right? right. So um, what we saw in response to this was now, w well, so all these oil, these gas, oil and gas platforms are shut in, right? So meaning they were, they're not producing. So maybe you think that's good, maybe you think that's bad, but at a minimum, all that oil was stored in at least the stuff that had been produced in the, the storage tanks, and that had to go somewhere. So then the conversation became, okay, we got to put all this oil in tanker trucks to move it to the um, refinery, right? Again, not the not the day-to-day -day production, but the stuff that built up. And there was huge pushback from different communities around that, right? Because they're like, oh, trucks aren't safe. So I think Bob's point is really important with all these controversies we've been talking about all, all semester, um, there's trade-offs with everything, right? And so, so it, it, it can be the case that pipelines are the safest and pipelines fail. And, and so when we, when we look at the impacts of these things and deciding should we, shouldn't we, how should we do this, it's important to, to make sure we have the, 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 the full facts and not just argue from an anecdotal one point in time uh, of, of one particular accident. That, that's an important point. We shouldn't discount that information, but it's a, it's a more complex situation. So it may not be the best thing to have a pipeline not working for six years, right? If you're still producing oil, that means that oil is going to go by ship, going to go by train, going to go by uh, uh, vehicle, 
and that's um, uh, additional risk, I would say, additional impact relative to if that stuff was moving through a, a single pipeline, a well-maintained pipeline. So, good point. And he, he, one of the things he brought up, there was half a half a million barrels of oil still in those two tanks up at the Las Flores Canyon that had to be what they call de-inventory, get to the refinery. So Exxon Mobil got an, uh, an emergency permit to truck that oil to the refinery. And I think it was. I think it was 30 truck trips a day for six months or something to get it out of there. They did it without a single mishap. So there's, you know, it's all risk management. Airplanes fall out of the sky. I mean, all this, you know, modern life is based on risk, and we need to do the best we can. But in this case, um, fortunately, even though pipelines are the safest, the trucking in this case, uh, you know, provided the safety enough to, to get that out of there. And coincidentally, Exxon, is actually has a proposal in place to be able to to restart at least one third of the production of the platform, 10,000 barrels a day, and truck it from the facility up to the refinery until the pipeline is fixed. So whether that gets approved or not, everybody has a public process around it. You can get involved in it if you want and, and participate in that conversation. Those things are going on now. Okay. Uh-oh, another one. The shuttering of Benico and the economic impacts of Santa Barbara Ventura County. The shuttering of Benico. Benico operated three platforms offshore, one of which was in state waters platform Holly. If you go up by UCSB, you'll see it there. It was about two miles out, I think. State waters is out to three miles, and then from uh, beyond that is what are called federal waters or the outer continental shelf. And that has to do with really a, a jurisdictional question. But interesting to note, if you have platforms that are out in federal waters, they're connected to the shore. They're connected through power cables, they're connected through pipelines, and so when they enter the state tidelands, the three mile limit, or they come on shore in a county, all of those governmental entities have an opportunity to uh, participate in the approval process. They have their own regulations, et cetera. So there's a, there's a comprehensive regulatory scheme in place. And, and the mo I say the most important of those would be the California Coastal Commission? And the state lands commission. So state lands commission like allows you to do a lease to to attach the pu the pipeline, let's say, to the seat bed, and then the California Coast Commission with the sort of overall coastal zone permitting and stuff of that nature. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to offer relative to responding to your question about the economic impacts. Uh, as far as one of the things was property values. Uh, property values relative to the assessed value of the facilities if they're not operating them, therefore the, the, set, the value is The down. commercial properties. Commercial properties, yes. And so that was a big factor. And matter of fact, uh, uh, Joe Holland, who is the clerk recorder assessor for the county of uh, Santa Barbara, he did a study both on the impacts of the pipeline shutdown, which would include Benicol in that context, and also of the, um, uh, the tragic mudslides in Montecito property values there and all of that. And he came up with you know significant reduction, millions and millions of dollars of devaluation of the property tax rolls based on, on those things. So you know, I can bore you with numbers, I've got them here, but suffice it to say, that was an area that you wouldn't necessarily think of, but it definitely impacts it. And property tax, by the way, by and large, uh, when it comes into a, a county, uh, every dollar, about half of that dollar is used in what's called the general fund. It's used for essential public services like police and fire and social services. And the other half goes back up to Sacramento and hopefully most of it comes back uh, for education. So about of every dollar of property tax, about half of it goes for social and public services and the other half goes for, for education. So that those, those, there's an impact uh, you know, beyond that. Um, the, the number that uh, the California Economic Forecast Project, Dr. Mark Schneep, said that r relative to the, to the, to the, uh, the shut-in, that it, it was impacting Santa Barbara County about 10 million a year. 10 million? 10 million. And that's separate from the property tax. That was, that's the economic, uh, you know, the direct, indirect, and induced multipliers of economics. Mm -hmm. uh, wages would be a direct impact. You take your wage and go buy something, that person then makes a living, that's an indirect, then they go out and buy something, that's an induced. So there's these, it's called the velocity of money, but that's where these 
the multiplier effect when you make a dollar what happens to it so also just for clarity so Venico didn't put the platforms in right the big oil companies put them in mm -hmm. and then it used to be that the big oil the the big oil companies did everything right they're the the driller folk or the explorer folks and the measurer folks and the and the drilling explorer folks and then the putting in the pipeline folks and then the sucking it out folks and the refining it folks and what's happened over the years and Bob can correct me if I'm wrong here is there's been a lot of fractionation of the company and the companies don't necessarily do everything now so they have subcontractors that do the or they hire a ship to do the drilling and they hire a company to do the this so in this case a lot of the so Exxon still has platforms but a lot of those big companies that originally put in engineered installed the the wells and the and the offshore platforms are not the ones that own them so Venico is one of the the daughter companies basically that purchased that that uh, uh, lease and that that infrastructure and then was producing it uh, from them and we see that on a lot of places where where once the reserves go down to a certain level there's still oil in the ground but the big guys kind of like you know I don't want to really deal with that and so these smaller operators come in and sometimes it's a single person like say on a farm or something like that in other cases it's something like this so Venico is having a tough time I think if it's fair to say just in general before this with the price of oil etc so if you're a big giant company, you can weather the economic ups and downs better than a, a small company, right? You don't have as many, uh, you don't have as much fiscal uh, free board to sort of absorb wages for a year or a couple years or something like that. Um, and they don't have wells in other parts of the world that might be profit more profitable to offset. And so they were, they were getting close. They had a proposal to do some stuff in Carpinteria, to do, to do some additional drilling in Carp Carpinteria, which the a public process uh, decided they didn't want to do that and so that didn't go ahead and so so they were kind of on thin ice and then when the pipeline shut down they were like they, they were around for a little bit and then they suddenly boom and so some of you guys right some of you guys in land use are working on the the platform issue right and so you guys can probably tell us more but um, w what they ended up doing was quick claiming uh, the platform that Bob is referring to back to the state and that had never happened I don't believe that had ever happened before so what that means is the company said we're bankrupt see ya and if you're if you're a clothing retailer and you go bankrupt you're like crap here's all my clothes see you later right um, and the investors fight over the the pants or the shirts or whatever but when you own a major piece of engineering out off the shore of the coast you you can't just really walk away from it, right? So what they did was they went to the state of California a couple days before they officially said that they were filing bankruptcy and they said, hey, just so you know, on whatever it was, Friday or Monday, I can't remember, you're gonna own a platform. <laughs> so ready, set, go, right? And so, um, and then they had a, a, a press release formally stating that they were, uh, the company was going into insolvency and then it was Merry Christmas. Boom, and, the, and so the state firstly said, whoa, 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 what? So the first thing the state did was hire on all the engineers and the people that were running the Venico plant for, I don't remember what it was, like three months or six months or something, right? And they said, so we want you guys to stay out there, right? Because me metal in salt water corrodes and valves pop open and all that kind of stuff. And the state does not move fast, right? So we gotta figure out what we wanna do with this, but in the meantime, we want you guys to not pump oil, but maintain all the, all the metal and, and keep it clean and all that kind of jazz, right? So that it doesn't fall apart and all of a sudden crumble in the ocean or, or, or spring a leak and have that oil spilling out. So the state of California was essentially maintaining, or still is maintaining that platform. Did you guys wanna chime in with anything quickly about your, is that, is that fair, is that a correct assessment? Federal agency. Yeah, federal agency. It's responsibility to um, look through or like go through the bond process so that. Now you're talking about platform Gale and platform Grace, right? Yeah. Because Holly's in state water. Right. right. Um, so they're figuring out the bond process. So they need to go through set the federal agencies that go through the CEQA process, the NEPA process, or whatever it is, have the funding to do that so that it's not. Now, Platform Holly 
thing was put in by mobile, I believe. Mm -hmm. And the mobile is owned by Exxon. Mm -hmm. And I believe Exxon's involved in a conversation about helping contribute to the decommissioning expenses. Yeah, right? and there's like another whole other argument of, um, because Benico did a little bit of building or engineering on that platform. Yeah, so they built a mezzanine on the side to yeah. take the hydrogen sulfide out. Oh. Very good. <laughs> so wait, so, so, so even though Exxon sold it wholly to Benico, there's some clause or something that said that yeah. if this ever has to be removed, you are responsible or you have a console? I mean, are they, are they fiscally responsible or are they just have to be in the decision like consulted? Oh, so that didn't transfer to Venico. And um, well, that's like their. That's the case. That's the case with most of the platforms. Huh. The, the majors have retained the abandonment liability. Oh, interesting. I didn't understand that. Okay, and, good. Um, there's also like a whole other conflict with how the 2010 Legacy Act is going to participate in it because now they can do partial removal instead of full removal mm -hmm. in California. Mm -hmm. And um, we're going to get to rigs the reef in a minute. Yeah, and we haven't done that yet, so we're not sure how exactly right. Right. it's going to. Right. Right. Cool. Cool. These kids are doing a good job. <laughs> Other couple quick things on that. Uh, there's also Rincon Island, which I'll get mm -hmm. to in a minute. Uh, Rincon Island, obviously, is going through abandonment. Same kind of story in a mm -hmm. different way. And Atlantic Richfield, Arco, is on the hook here okay. and helping work out, work that out. So. Okay. But the state will probably be on the hook for a certain amount of it. Um, in, in that regard, but just want you to know, and I'm not defending the oil industry, but virtually all of the platforms, the majors did maintain the abandonment liability. On okay. Them. Eventually, Chevron in particular, a lot of the platforms were put in by Union Oil and by Texaco, and those are Union Oil is now owned by Chevron, and Texaco is now owned by Sh Chevron. So Chevron's got a lot of the abandonment liability, and so Chevron is a very big player in the rig to reef movement. Okay. Because it's for engineering feats to try to pull those platforms out, as you'll see in a minute. One of them's taller than the Empire State Building. Good discussion. You guys are doing good. 